Oi. All right. Neil Howe, uh, you've been introduced to me as the foremost uh, demographer of our time, so I'm I'm pretty excited about Let's this. Let's just tone down expectations here. <laughs> so, you know, we, you and I, we were talking on the telephone uh, earlier, uh, and one of the things that you had said is, is, is that, you know, really, it's never as good as the first time, so we tried to cap the conversation <laughs> right. as much as possible before we got into it. But, you know, uh, th this, this conversation that we're going to have is going to be all about uh, demographics and retirement, not just demographics, but, you know, in the context of your fourth turning um, idea, the, the, that framework. First, let's just start out with the framework, the fourth turning. Tell us, uh, how does that relate to demographics and retirement? Well, uh, a lot of what I do is demography. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people usually define demography pretty narrowly as people who study Fertility, mortality, morbidity, migration, you know what I mean? They just put down the numbers in a population. And, and one of the interesting things about demography is that when you specify all these things, and a lot of them are known pretty well, they don't change very fast, right? You can be pretty certain about numbers in the population going way out. Right. <laughs> and it's one of the very few certain things you can tell about the future. I think that's the one claim to fame of demographers, or at least one strength of, of the way they study populations, uh, uh, is this great kind of forecasting capability because, and demography is like a giant super tanker ship. You know, <laughs> you start revving up fertility, it's gonna take 20 years before those people can even enter the workplace. You know what I mean? It doesn't change very fast, right? So this is one of the great strengths of demography. And obviously when you're studying issues such as uh, old age dependency ratios, you know, how much is it going to cost to pay for the old relative to those who are number of working? I mean, demography is just central to that. I mean, that's, where, that's what we live for, you know? Right. <laughs> Calculating those ratios <laughs> and spinning out that timeline. And I mean, that's where we shine, right? Um, I will say that one thing that demography does not pay much attention to, it's really not part of their field, but it is something that's it's sort of my other field mm -hmm. that I, I've sort of invented, you might say, is to look at populations not just in terms of numbers and how many are in each age bracket, but also to look at how people are shaped in their attitudes and behaviors by their childhood and coming of age experiences. Right. And how those... Um, those, 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 those attitudes and behaviors age with those cohorts through life. So these are what we call generations. And each generation reshapes every phase of life they move through. And that adds a whole new dimension to demography. You know what I mean? It kind of like adds, it's sort of like making chess three-dimensional. <laughs> right. Because now you don't have just numbers. You have qualitative shifts in each of these groups as a, moving through what I like to call the generational diagonal. And so as I often explain to people, if you have, if you have age on a y-axis and time on an x-axis, we all live a diagonal line. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And a generation is a group of diagonal lines. And a single event is a vertical line through all those diagonal lines, right? It hits people at different ages. Right, yes. Right? And what most people do is that they study these vertical lines, right? They study events, or they may study a phase of life. You know, they'll, they'll study old age, you know, over time. And they're, they're looking at a horizontal line, right? And the problem with that is, is that when you're studying a phase of life as just, you know, I'm studying midlife. I study, you know, I study youth, right? And you see there are a lot of histories out there, histories of youth in America, histories of old age in America. A typical history book is a history of midlife people, right? Because right. they're all the leaders. <laughs> they're like the presidents and the congressmen, you know? So they're all between age 45 and 70 or something. So you're basically looking at one age bracket. What I set out to do, lo these many years ago, a long time now, I guess late, late 80s. Oh, yeah. It's been oh, a yeah. long time. Uh -huh. Is to look at history from a different perspective. And I was amazed. Bill Strauss and I, we were the ones who, who wrote a lot of these books originally. We were amazed to discover that no one actually looked at the diagonal lines. Right. Everyone just looked at phases of life or periods. So if you read the history of America, it's like, what was everyone doing in 1851? What was everyone doing in 1861, 1871? And it's just all these people 
But what about the experience of each group of people over time? So that's what we did. And in our original book, Generations, we did that. And we, we looked at these generations. What we found is, is that even going all the way back to the 17th century, sort of the first old world migrants to the new world, mm -hmm. um, we found that generations had very different collective personalities. Right. And they, you know, the, the older generation had very different attitudes of how the young generation was growing up. All kinds of worries and apprehensions, because even back then they knew about generational differences. Uh, and they knew that it wasn't just that they were older or younger. They were never like them. You know what I mean? These new kids were just not the same. And, and that's not all we found. We found not only were people very aware of generational differences, but types of generations, what we later call archetypes, tend to recur in the same order right. historically. So it's almost like a, a curve. Of, well, it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a wave uh, when you look at their impact on history. Right. It's a wave. Uh -huh. But the actual generations, for instance, a, um, a, a generation that, you know, sort of a um, heroic history making changing generation, mm -hmm. you know, that takes the country through great wars and, and founds all kinds of new institutions. Uh, typically is followed by a rather timid, risk-averse generation. They were the children during the war. You know, they're careful not to upset, you know, everything that was just created. Everyone just lost all these lives on their behalf. Woo, you know. Right. And a good example of that would be the, the GI generation, uh -huh. generation went through World War II, and the so-called silent generation, <laughs> who were the kids of World War II and the Great Depression. And they were famous for... You know, I don't want anything to go on my permanent record. You know, right. and, and they they were very cautious. They were very risk averse. They all dressed in three piece suits. You know, in, in their early twenties, they they, were, they they played by the rules, and ultimately they did very well economically. They got rewarded by the rules. You know, this is the generation that's today in their late seventies and eighties, and they're all getting defined benefit pension plans. They're they're all doing really well. Right. You know. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, they've done very well economically. But then you have other generations which have different locations in history and different uh, um, uh, uh, characteristic orders. For instance, following a generation like boomers, which come of age during these periods that periodically happen in American history, these great awakenings, mm -hmm. these great upheavals in the culture. You know, when we reinvent art and, and literature and uh, dynamics between races and ethnicities and, and just... Just just reinvent the culture. I mean, that's what happens during awakenings. And religion, you know, typically too in our history. Those things happen during awakenings. And following these generations, you usually have a left alone generation. We call the nomad archetype. And this would be like Generation X. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, these are the left alone kids. You know, these are the kids that no one had time for because everyone was finding themselves. You know what I mean? But Gen yeah. Xers. By the way, the, as you say that, I was, I'm thinking about Macaulay Culkin and the. There movie. we go, yeah. Home Alone. <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> but, but what's interesting and fascinating to us is that Gen Xers is not the first of this kind of right. generation. The Lost Generation had that same, the Gilded Generation. These are all kind of bad boy generations, you know, just by their names. Lost, Gilded, Cavalier is, a, is another one going back into the 17th century. So these are very, those are fascinating archetypes, but they come in certain characteristic orders. Now that order is connected to, uh, and, and not only in American history, but we think in many other countries around the world, is connected to another fascinating pattern, which many people have noticed, particularly in American history, and that is what's often called the long cycle in politics. Right. The fact yes. that we have major civic crises that kind of redefine who we are as a nation, politically, institutionally, in very fundamental ways, about once every long human life. <laughs> right. About 80 or 90 years. I mean, you look at the War of Spanish Succession. Uh, it, was, it was probably the first great global war in, in European history, uh, which, which happened, you know, way back around 1700. And it was the glorious revolution in, 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 in England. But it was a huge event in the colonies. And then about a lifetime after that, you had the American Revolution. Lifetime after the Civil War, lifetime after that the Great Depression, World War II, and a lifetime time after that, you're here with here us today. Here we are. Yes. You know, so here we are. And roughly halfway in between those great outer world uh, events, you have the great inner world events, and these are the awakenings, which we just talked about. 
And, and in terms of American history, these have typically been characterized as awakenings in religion. We even, we, that's what we call them, the first great awakening, the second right, great yes. awakening. And we, we number them. Uh, and, and many people call the 60s and 70s America's fourth or fifth great awakening, depending on how you want to you know, start your count. You could start it with you know, Jonathan Edwards in the 1700s or with John, John Winthrop in the 1600s, right? But here's my point is that when you look at these mood shifts that are very characteristic, you see how they're driven by the generational change. And this is what creates a closed system. History creates generations by creating these moods. Mm -hmm. And then these generations grow up, become midlife parents and leaders, and create history. You see how that works? Right. History creates generations, generations later create history. history. And, you and know, this is the dynamic. And so, you know, as you say that, I mean, the immediate thought that I have, and, you know, this goes back to the conversation that you and I were having on the telephone right. yesterday, is about uh, where we are right now. Because the sense that I'm getting is that the particular, and, and this isn't just in the U.S., but globally in developed economies, the particular social economic ideology, the prevailing ideology, let's call it neoliberalism as an example, right. which is very much in the Gen X uh, form. And boomers. Right. Yeah, boomer and Gen mm -hmm. X. Yeah, absolutely. It's breaking down. People are, are not right. believing in it in the way they used to. Well, that, that's one attribute of what we call this, this hero archetype of the civic generation, and that is the strong belief of wanting to gravitate toward community. And we're seeing that all around the world. It's, by the way, this is not, these generations aren't just the United States. Right. This is in much of the world today. We see everyone kind of assuming a similar generational pattern because, you know, a lot of the world had the 60s and the 60s and, a lot of, and much of the world had the World War II and the Great Depression, right? So we're all on a similar schedule, but you look at this new, this new populism, Mm -hmm. which is basically believes in uh, the, the power of, of ordinary people and community plus authority. <laughs> you know, those two things together. Right. Authority and populism. And, and people ha have to remember that historically, populism always means authoritarianism. Right. These two things go together. Ever since uh, the word populism, by the way, interestingly, was, was, was first used to describe Julius Caesar. He was head of the populares, you know, not the optimes. They were the good people. They were the senators. But Julius Caesar was the authoritarian side of the populism, right? And it has been true ever since. So you have Viktor Orban, you know, in Hungary. You've got Vladimir Putin. You've got Narendra Modi. You've got Xi Jinping. You, you got them all over the world now. You got uh, Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines. I mean, I could just go down all these, all these new kinds of leaders we're seeing today. And you know what they're appealing to? Two things really interesting that mm -hmm. we didn't see in these leaders 30 years ago. Okay. They're appealing to the mainstream of their community. They don't give a damn about the minorities, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Narendra Modi cares about the Hindus, and that's his group. <laughs> Everyone else can kind of go to hell, you know what I mean? And Xi Jinping, he cares about the Han Chinese, the great Han, as he calls them. And everyone in China now is going back to wearing old Han clothing. They're eating Han food. I mean, everyone's going, everyone's redefining themselves now in terms of this great majoritarian culture. You look at uh, Shinzo Abe mm -hmm. in Japan. He's the same thing. He's finding traditional, you know, the, the Shinto, you know, <laughs> he's going back. To, everyone is doing this. Again, you, you look around the world. Uh, uh, even if you, Brazil, is it, Brazil, yeah, you've you've got uh, you, you've you've got Jair, uh, and 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 uh, even even an example like um, Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to be a citizen of nowhere. Do you want to be a citizen of somewhere? Right. You know? And you know, That's the it. interesting thing about Johnson when you say that is that it seems to me, and I mean, this is what a lot of Brits think, is that he's picked up on the zeitgeist, meaning that totally. he's a chameleon. And he's decided, you know, this is what's happening, and I'm going to glom onto it. Like any great leader, he senses where the opportunities are. You know what I mean? And I, I absolutely believe, I absolutely agree with you. But here's my point: is this populism we're seeing in America right now, which which obviously took over the the Republican Party in 2016, and it's kind of waiting, trying to take over the Democratic Party. We'll see. You know. Uh, it's interesting. We just had the Iowa caucuses last night, and everyone's kind of wondering about the results. 
But you understand what's happening here. We're reshaping politics according to this. This is fundamentally millennial. Right. Now, this is the overall, and people get too hung up on right wing versus left wing. Yeah, that was I the next thing I was talk, going to talk about. Right. Let me give you a great example of, of millennial, mm -hmm. okay? This is a good example. Sebastian Kurtz is the first millennial leader of Europe. Right. 33 years old. He's chancellor of Austria. He's actually now voted in second time as chancellor. <laughs> he was actually booted out in a horrible scandal last year, but now he's back. He's very popular. He is so millennial. He is so nice. I mean, this guy is just oozes niceness in all of his interviews. And, and Austrians love him. And young people love him, right? But here's the interesting thing about him. He used to be, he's the, he's the head of the conservative party, the People's Party. He's, he's sort of the, you know, the center-right party in, in Austria. And he used to be linked up with the, with the Freedom Party, the, right? you know, the yes. really extreme right-wing party. Well, they got booted out. That was a scandal. They got rid of them. You know, he's brought on board just happily the Green Party. So now it's, the, now it's the conservatives and the Greens. And what a great millennial slip. Why can't we just get along? It doesn't matter that we're left and right. We both believe in the same thing. We believe in security, order. I mean, what do the Greens want? They want radical environmentalism to sort of just slow down all this technological progress, right? And what does the right wing part of this coalition want? No immigration. <laughs> they want no change. They want security, order, slow down change. We can all cohere around communities that we'll be comfortable with. And by the way, this is, I think, the emerging mentality of Europe today. Right. You know, in the, in the, in the last parliamentary election, the big slogan that all the mainstream parties used was, um, was uh, uh, a Europe that protects, you know, l'Europe qui protège, you know. This was the slogan. 15 years ago, it was a Europe that progresses, a Europe that is, you know, doing great, that's advancing rights around the world. No, 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 no. It's, a, it's this hunkering down mentality. It's sort of like we can't control the world and we don't want the world to bother us. <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting that Britain left when it did. Right, right. You know, I mean, there are a lot of different ways that we can go from there in terms of the splintering and why Britain right. left. But, you know, I think on a, uh, a sort of macro level, what I'm wondering is how does this uh, fragmentation, this, uh, I, you know, a need for order develop uh, now, irrespective of the, of, you know, what's happened in the past and different, but what happened uh, that caused the the order to break down such that people well, are, are looking things. for stability. There are two things. First of all, millennials were raised with order. They were fussed over by protective parents, right? Given rules, assured that everything was gonna go all right. Everyone sort of made sure that everything went fine with them. <clears throat> they were encouraged not to take any risks. Millennials are also a famously risk-averse generation. Mm -hmm. They're a very community-oriented generation. I mean, we know the risk-averseness, by the way, because you know they're not drinking, not smoking, not. The crime rate is way down for this gender. I mean, you name it, and the CDC has 150 youth risk surveillance indicators. Mm -hmm. They're all down. But, so this is also true of them. But they want to create a world in which you can live in a more supervised way and live, live a good life and not have so much uncertainty and risk. All these things that Gen Xers like you, <laughs> you know, I mean, all of us, all of right. us boomers and Gen Xers, we wanted a more risky world. We wanted more individualism. We wanted an entrepreneurial state. Uh, uh, we want free, wanted more free agency in our lives. The last thing that boomers wanted was a strong middle class. Guess what's the first thing millennials want? A strong middle class. And by the way, that's why they're flocking to Bernie. Not because they're attracted by any bizarre, you know, left-wing cultural ideas. Mm -hmm. This is what boomers mistake when they look at the whole fascination with Bernie Sanders. No, Bernie's promising them a strong middle in America that they can just belong to a team and not have to compete so much because they look up at their exer parents and their boomer parents and they just see people that are competing themselves to death, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you understand that right. these are kind of the differences that I think they sense and, and where they're going. We had, by the way, a very similar kind of generation back in the uh, coming of age in the, in the early 1930s, late 1920s. This was the GI generation, right? Right. An estimated 85% of them voted for FDR and the New Deal. I mean, that was a massive tidal wave in 1932 and 1936. Mm -hmm. This is the first generation of African-Americans 
to vote for the Democratic Party, no longer for the party of Lincoln, right? So this is a massive shift, and it was all in this generation. And what did they do? Community, community. All those WPA murals with GIs that were all in teams. You know, they're all building things in teams, and they're all muscular, you know, they've they all been given vitamins, and they were literally taller than the last generation. So they were, and they all joined unions. This right. is the yes. this is the generation. Uh, you know, they all did the sit down strikes. The you know the CIO, particularly kind of the radical union movement. A lot of them joined the Communist Party, and it's interesting. You know, so a lot of them were dedicated. A lot of the best and brightest of this generation were dedicated to the overthrow of of capitalism right. in the United yes. States. And whenever a boomer has problems with the millennials, because I think too many of them are are, are are you know voting for Bernie Sanders, I, would you prefer? A generation like we had in the 1930s, where they actually were card-carrying members of a party dedicated to our nation's overthrow, that's what we had in the 1930s, right? And by the way, in the 1930s, it was also a very isolationist generation, mm. almost up to Pearl Harbor. Right, They yes. were signing the Oxford Peace Pledge. I never want to go to war. Of course, once the country clearly galvanized around the issue, they were more than happy to join, right? And they did. And they galvanized the country and they created a whole new sense of civic purpose and they invested hugely in this country's future. And I would argue that still today, we're living off those investments. All this infrastructure we see built around right. us that boomers have never invested in, Xers have never invested. We don't care about it. We just let it go, right? It's because they built it. So we need a new generation to come along and fill that void, right? The senior citizen generation is almost gone. This new generation, silent generation, they don't like to call themselves senior citizen. And no boomer will call themselves a senior citizen. That doesn't fit at all, right? So one interesting rule of generations is that when one generation of one archetype passes away, mm -hmm. it almost creates a void that another generation yes. has uh -huh. to fill right. functionally. I, I often compare this to like, if you take you know one of these uh, Kind of glass enclosures that you that you uh, uh, grow plants in, right? Mm -hmm. And you tear one plant out, and you just you put a new plant in anywhere in there. It will always grow to the empty space. Right. right? It'll always grow because that's where the sunlight, that's where the role is. And I, I do believe that's true of generations, and I think that helps keep because these archetypes are important. You need a generation like a prophet archetype like boomers to reshape the culture and to think deep thoughts. You know to come up with 60s music. You know, occasionally you need that kind of generation. But then you also need a generation of builders and doers. You, you, need, you need all types. Um, and I do believe there's a certain um, process of compensation and correction in how the, the thing that I found really interesting about where you were going, we, we sort of uh, talked a little bit about it tangentially, is about the left and the right. Immediately when you started talking about the 30s, I thought to myself, you're talking about FDR, but we know for a fact there was Mussolini and Hitler on the other side, and in many ways Even here, there was Father Cochrane. Right. There was there was a, we had Huey Long. I mean, people look at the 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 fascists as uh, you know a negative, obviously because of of genocide. Right. However, uh, they were looking towards the same sorts of things. So, from my perspective, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's Stalin, and he wasn't bad in the. In the genocide department. <laughs> I mean, no, that, just, to be fair here, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> well, we, yeah, what, what I'm getting the equal at, opportunity is, is, is that it's not necessarily the case that it's necessarily left versus right. That's my point. My point was is that that era was an era of populist dictators all around the world. I'm just saying, and it was very similar to the era we're having today. Remember, as the think back in the mood in the in the late twenties and thirties, when um, when you, you had no concert of nations anymore that had been wiped out by by World War One, and then you had the League of Nations, but it proved to be toothless, right? Sort of that was Wilson's dream, and it never did anything. And then suddenly you had the rise, particularly once the Great Depression started, and there was desperation. But you had the rise of all of these dictators, all these authoritarian leaders with no global concert to restrain them, mm, right? Right, yes. Much like today.
I mean, we think of the world now, NATO is no longer, we, everyone laments, right? We no longer have a concert of nations today. We're all going different directions. NATO's toothless. We no longer, anyone is signing treaties anywhere. We had smooth Holly tariff, you know? Right. We have the Trump tariff. I mean, but my point is, is that the mood globally was very similar. The mood in terms of feelings about inequality were very similar, very obviously. So. And the actual trend in inequality was very similar. I mean, that was a peak in the late 1920s, right? And it's obviously very high today. It reached its all-time low, by the way, when the GI generation was right about to retire. Late 1960s, early 70s, right. probably the low point of the Gini coefficient uh, over the last you know, century, right? And then we have other trends that are interesting that are similar. Think about living patterns. I know a lot of people remember all those Frank Capra movies. You remember uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, oh, yeah, and You Can't Take It right. With You, and all those you know, wonderful movies. And they all showed these big Victorian homes with multi-generational families. Right. You know, they're, all, they're all like living together. You know, Jimmy Stewart and usually his parents were, you know, and they're all like living in this big thing. And then after World War II, of course, we all got rid of that. Everyone wanted the nuclear family. We all moved into Levittown and, you know, and, 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 and suddenly we had this huge 30, 40 year gold rush of home building, right? And, and the development of the suburbs and the number of adults per household went down, 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 down. It was a huge tailwind for home construction. Guess what's happening now? The number of adults per household is going back up again. Houses are getting crowded again. And all those huge McMansions that boomers bought are beginning to look like those Victorian ramblers back in mm. the Frank Capra movies, right? They got multi-generational families living again in them. We're right back where we started from. And in fact, you know, the rise of multi-generational living is a stunning sociological fact. We thought that the nuclear family was here forever. No, it lasted about one and a half generations. <laughs> and now we're back to a much more primordial pattern, right? Families all living together again. And millennials, by the way, are driving that pattern. I mean, about 20% of 25 to 34 year olds, I mean, that's getting into an old age yeah, bracket, are is. living with an older generation, typically their parents. Uh, this hasn't been true, by the way, since 1930, you know, 8, 1937. It's, it's very high on historical terms. So again, it's, it's all these parallels that interest me. Uh, the fact that generations are actually in their own personal lives getting along better, but in terms of their overall national economic interest are diverging, right? right? And, um, and the problem here is that boomers and Xers who believe in free agency and believe in a much more you know, wide open capitalist system and everything have given up doing anything to collectively invest in our future, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as I said, no one gives a damn about infrastructure anymore. When it comes to dams, I think the only thing boomers have done is actually tear them down. I mean, it's interesting. Right. All those dams that their parents built, they're actually tearing them down. They're going into Oregon and various places, they're pulling down all that stuff. So my point is, we have generations now that tear down infrastructure. Um, and when it comes to things that used to be taken for granted, uh, when boomers went to school, public paid for it. State colleges were very often free. I went to University of California, you know, and uh, and I went to San Diego, San Diego and Berkeley, and I think I paid eighty five dollars per semester. Best best universities in the country. I paid almost nothing, and guess what? Guess who paid for it? That generation we hated, the GI generation. You know, they all uncomplainingly paid taxes to pay for all the professors, so that all these boomers could go out and ask interesting questions and denounce everything they had built, <laughs> right? But now, boomers and Xers, no, no, you pay for your own education. And, and, and you build your own infrastructure. You know, you, we're not gonna build anything for you, right? And, but you've got a lot of liabilities to us. You better right. pay yeah, for yes, it, right? Definitely. All those unfunded liabilities for Social Security and Medicare. Oh yeah, by the way, those will be taken out of your FICA tax. If I were a millennial, I'd be outraged. You know, you boomers were given everything publicly, right? You never replaced anything that was built. And now, look what you're doing. 
you want to take all your marbles back from the from the generation that's coming after you. Now, I think again, I, I bring out that contrast between public life and private life. I think personally, in their personal and family lives, I think boomers and 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 millennials get along very well together. Right. Uh, you just see it. I mean, they're they're calling each other every day. I mean, you see the closeness is there. Uh, boomers, by the way, in their twenties, never called their GI generation parents, <laughs> and it wasn't because we didn't have cell phones either. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, <laughs> we didn't yeah, want didn't to call, talk to them. I didn't call either that <laughs> okay. much myself. All right, that's the point. But you you know where I'm coming from. Uh, and no one back then lived with their parents. And by the way, it wasn't just because of the economy. The 1982-83 recession was pretty brutal. Right. Yeah. And you didn't see any boomers and Xers going home to mom and dad, did you? I don't think so. You'd live under a, a, a highway or something. You'd do everything, anything, rather than go back to live with them. That is different. And I, by the way, I think that's hugely positive. And actually, that's one key to how we're going to solve this problem eventually. Because in the end, we're going to have to cancel out those obligations. The only way we're going to be investing again in the future you know, for millennials or any other generation coming along. And that just to have a sense of future again for our country is we can't spend so much on obligations to the past. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and by the way, but, this but is what Gene point, was saying. Exactly. Yeah. And Gene Storley is incredibly eloquent on this. And he has all these accounting that, you know, generational accounting, which demonstrates this. But, but I think the critical trade-off is the one reason why we'll be able to do that, I mm -hmm. think, and this is, this is positive, People often accuse me of being a pessimist, you know, and I, but I'm not. I'm actually very positive. I think one very positive trade-off will be precisely because millennials and boomers get along so well in their family lives, it will allow, it will allow boomers to relinquish a lot of these third-party transfer payments, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. that they want to take because a lot of them now have young people around them in some form or another uh, helping to take care of them. And I think ultimately, when push comes to shove, you know, this isn't going to happen on a sunny, bright, nice day. This is going to happen on a stormy day. Right. <laughs> when we're looking for resources as a nation, uh, we're going to have to make that trade off. So, w when you were talking about all of that, the first thing that I thought of is what does that mean in terms of the politics of today? Because when I think of, uh, most people think of Trump as being authoritarian, and they think of him as being someone who is moving in that direction, okay, and that's true to a certain degree. But in terms of a lot of the things that the millennials want in terms of safety, uh, he's not necessarily offering that. So in some ways, you could say it could go either way going forward in the United States, well, whether that's why you're talking left or right. That's, why you don't, that's one of the reasons why you don't see many, you know, they're not armies of millennials voting for Trump, are they? Right. And, you know, that's part of the issue. Bernie Sanders is a more interesting case. You, mm -hmm. know? Um, uh, you know, when it comes to security and order, you just think, no choices. Single payer health care. Right. It's yes. kind of it's kind of like your Apple phone. You know, there's only one of them. And you, right. don't, you don't even have to, they're not different models. There's just <laughs> there's just it's like a Google page, you know. There's only one. You just go there and get your business done, you know. And and millennials are used to that. I think what consumer behavioral psychologists often talk about, or even cognitive psychologists talk about, the paradox of choice. You know, this, mm -hmm. the, the famous Schwartz book, right, about how too many choices paralyze you. I think millennials are more bothered by that than older generations. And it's fascinating. I've done a lot of work in, in uh, employer benefits. And I mm -hmm. know that when, you know, the employer offers 30 different kinds of pension plans and you know what I mean? All oh, this huge yeah. variety of plans. Xers love it. It's like, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> I get the thing that's, because all every X is looking for their corner solution that works just for me. You know, I don't want to be part of the crowd in any of that. And you offer 35 different, you know, plans to millennials and they're like, feel betrayed, they're disappointed. And, and why? If you ask them, they'll say, because you know which one's best, you just won't tell me. Right. <laughs> Meaning, they wanna to be told, they wanna to be given advice. I mean, clearly they can't just all be equal. I mean, there must be a best one, and if there is a best one, why don't we all just join it? it it's such a different- Mentality. Mentality, it's such a different outlook. Uh, uh, and, and, and I think that's behind, you know, Many of these things we see only only it's not in consumer goods; it's in it's in politics. 
But even even the whole privacy argument, you know, about a th- kind of authoritarianism that's expressed through technology, right? Mm-hmm. The surveillance state, as we now like to call it. The fact that you would just have, you know, cameras everywhere and pretty soon they'll be sensing your voice, your 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 your, your footsteps. I mean, you know, everything right. now is going to be tagged. Millennials are less bothered by that than older generations. Because ultimately, that's going to be a safer world, right? Well, Everyone will be looked after. Someone in need, a criminal would be caught. It's this kind of the attitude today in China, right? Well, you don't have to worry about, uh, uh, you know, the the, uh, the the social credit system if if you didn't do anything wrong. Right. <laughs> that's kind of the that's the chilling response of uh, of someone who's kind of bought into the authoritarian system. Right. It's like the uh, Tom Cruise movie with the precogs. Uh, right. Right. Know, exactly. The, um, you know, this is where the rubber hits the road, by the way, in terms of uh, if you think about asset markets and things like that, because what you're talking about right now, you're talking about things that involve antitrust. We're talking about things that involve privacy. And so all of those companies, the Googles, the Amazons, the Apples of the world are definitely uh, on on the Any, brink there. Antitrust is a huge issue. And, you know, both Bernie Sanders... Uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, and uh, Amy Klobuchar mm-hmm. are both huge on antitrust. This is probably I, I realize it lately hasn't got a lot of attention, but this is one, this is a big issue in this race now. I think antitrust is probably more talked about now than it has been in a long time, and not just pricing power and kind of monopoly power, sort of uh, market concentration, but also new and emerging issues of price discrimination. Mm which I think is one of the big hidden antitrust issues of our time. It's being practiced everywhere by big pharma, by colleges. You look at universities now, they, they find out exactly how much cost every family can stand. And they now, you know, since their, their retail price is $150,000 a year, they'll bring it down to just the point that you can stand. Right. Well, this used to be a crime. You know, the FTC used to prosecute people for actually looking at your ability to pay before giving you a price. It's standard now. You know, Safeway has this personalized pricing. Everyone does it. And all these extras, they say, oh, they have a price for me. Isn't that great? <laughs> and, you know, I think, are you kidding? You know, that's how they extract all of that consumer surplus. Right. For them, it no longer goes for you. And I think in, 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 in kind of parallel to what we're saying, if you look at the new generation of economists in Chicago, mm-hmm. you know, this is two generations after all of the great Chicago economists who got rid of antitrust law. You know, when I'm talking about, you know, Robert Bork and Aaron Director, and I mean, all the greats who basically just said, ah, you know, we just uh, should think about consumer welfare and just get rid of all this antitrust stuff. You look at the new generation today in the University of Chicago, they're all in favor of stricter antitrust. So they here too, you see the millennial wave. You see what I mean? Right. There too, you see the new millennial wave coming in. And, you know, and, and what's interesting uh, is that even the Republicans are now pushing oh yeah. antitrust. Right. Look at Josh Hawley now, Senator Josh Hawley. Uh, even even Trump often talks favorably about breaking up, you know, some of these, you know, the big telecoms or big pharma. Certainly, he doesn't very much like all of those uh, Bay, Bay Area based <laughs> Seattle or Bay Area based uh, tech companies. He'd love to break them up just for spite. But again, it's not right and left, right? Right. Yeah. It's the era we're entering. You know, um, and and the re- the real question for me, I think you alluded to this before is, uh, you know, the transition period, right? You were saying before at some point in time that it's going to happen in a period of, I don't know what the term was that you used, chaos, but it's not going to be a smooth transition. Never is. Never is. And people don't, you know, remember that when we, you know, you know, everyone looks at Social Security, you know. Social Security, by the way, everyone thinks that was such a big thing. Social Security was one part of 35 other things in the Social Security Act of 1935. I mean, that was massive legislation. It set up means-tested benefits for young families, for the disabled. I, I mean, at that time, we called them the lame and the crippled, <laughs> halting or something. Right. Anyway, everything was labeled differently. But we set up all that stuff, right? The, practically the whole welfare state. Was that done on a sunny day? 1935, I think you know the answer to that one, right? This is a time of crisis in America. Big things are done um, under duress, and Mm. that's when people have, because when things are 
pleasant. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? No one wants to change anything. And this is why, by the way, and the Fed is worried about this. Mm -hmm. I, I'll tell you an interesting speech that um, uh, Jerome Powell, Chairman Jerome Powell, gave recently to the uh, House Budget Committee. And uh, the House Budget Committee was very flattered that he came. I think it's been something like, I don't know, eight or nine years since the last time a Fed <laughs> chairman spoke to their committee. You know, they're feeling kind of unloved lately. No one really cares about what they do anymore. <laughs> But anyway, you got the budget committee. And he basically said, I have one fear. I thought it was a, a brilliant passage. He said, I have one fear, and that is, you know, we're now running record low unemployment. Mm -hmm. We're running 5% of GDP deficit. Right. How many times in the post-war era have we run a 5% GDP deficit? I'll tell you, it's only five times. Four was right around the time of the Great Recession. And one was that 1982, 83 uh, recession we were talking about. That's it. Right. Record low unemployment. We are now under Trump running a five percent of GDP, you know, deficit. And he and it, and anyway, his point was though. He said, "Here's what I fear: is that you're not doing anything about it now. In fact, your times are good. Let's just right. run it some more. Keep this expansion going." But here's what he said. He said, here's what I fear, is that when suddenly we go into a recession, we go into a bad recession, we go into market panic. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's when all the, all the everything becomes, you know, um, uh, kind of everything tumbles down together. The Fed will be out of ammo, right? I mean, we'll be down to the zero bound and, you know, we'll be sort of out of many tools. And it will only be at that moment when Congress suddenly says, wow, we're running a huge deficit. We need to cut that down. <laughs> but you know the psychology of budget cutting is the opposite of the economics of budget cutting. Right. And that's my point. Right, right? yeah. That's what's going to happen, right? And you can just see it. Do you think we're suddenly going to say, oh, the economy is just massively spiraling into recession. Let's just not tax for three years <laughs> and run a... 18% of GDP debt. No, that's not going to be the political response. The political response is going to be the opposite. And, and that, I think, was, a, was a, a very well phrased. And I think that is actually the mix of what I call the fourth turning, when suddenly even your efforts to correct things are happening at the wrong moment. And it's in, the, it's in those periods where you suddenly can say, well, OK, if everything is going to change anyway, if all of the rules now have to be different, and if we're all going to be suffering kind of anyway, let's do something really new. Let's just rewrite the whole rules of the game. Let's completely rewrite. Let's completely redo how we do healthcare. Let's completely redo how we do community planning and, and you know, urban development. Let's completely redo how we do education. That's what we do in these creative moments. A little bit like, you know, when we first passed, you know, homesteading legislation <laughs> at the peak of the Civil War. You know, it's kind of an interesting combination. Yeah, Transcontinental Railroad. Are you thinking about that when you're still thinking about, you know, beating, beating uh, Robert E. Lee on the battlefield? But I think the idea that we wait for a time of plenty, you know, to come up with our big ideas or implement, you know, big, bold new ideas. That's actually not how history works. I think that's a great way for us to end it right there. You are an optimist after all. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Thank you. Thank you so much.